Kann. Good evening, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. I've not muted anyone, so you're welcome to talk before we start and the others will join. Are you still all locked down at home with the COVID or are you going to work, coming back or working from home? Not with COVID, because of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a point. That is a point. They have asked us not to come to office till December. Wow. But you have to still work. <laughs> yes. yes, if you want money, Moolah. Moolah. <laughs> You're better <laughs> from home. That's true. Why is it called Moolah? Because of Moolah Dara? It's just a joke. It's just a joke. It's not so bad. It's not so it's bad. Still bad. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Virendra, you want to say something? Yeah, it's lockdown at home only. Uh, but yeah, sometimes to get, you know, some uh, necessary groceries and all some, like we need to go. But then there are, you know, a lot of complications along with it. We're so frightened nowadays. <laughs> You know, so many cases are there. Like It's true. And I think in, in our city, for example, we're in Bangalore, there's no restriction on, you know, checking anymore. They're not checking people who are coming in, going out, nothing. So we have no idea who has it anymore. Well, they're testing if you have symptoms, of course. Not really. It's more or less off. Okay. So, so oh my God, this is all getting recorded. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Let's start. <laughs> I completely forgot we're recording. I... Paused it earlier and I, I didn't. It. Pause it again. You can cheat and chat. So no. even the bad joke got recorded. I yeah, yeah. It That's wasn't it. that bad. A few days back, I have seen uh, Amit ji on um, you know some convention or was giving some interview. He was looking very different. I, I think he has put on now. It's a, it's a lockdown wait, and this is also recording <laughs> after lockdown. Who cares during lockdown? <laughs> It's okay if it's a lockdown wait. It shouldn't be a locked in wait. It's, yes. not, locked in. it's not locked in. It'll lock out soon. It'll lock out soon. <laughs> All right, let's start. Let's close our eyes. Listen, I have a seven-year-old at home, and you know, like I buy all this stuff for him, and then I eat all of it. So, okay. <laughs> Doctor Sagar, you've also unmuted yourself. Yes. Hi, Atman was saying something. I just I was missing the conversation. <laughs> All right, you're just talking about stuff of the day right now. Anyway, so let's start off. Let's close our eyes, connect down to the palate. Inhale and exhale, relax the body. Inhale fresh prana. Exhale all the used of prana, especially those of you who've been working. Let's align ourselves to what we're going to do now. Let's invoke to the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chokotsu, Lord Mahagaruji Mayu. To all the great ones, especially the great teachers and the masters of theosophy, to the great beings of knowledge, light, and wisdom, to the angels and beings of communication, our respective internets and Wi-Fi connections, to our soul and divine self, we humbly ask for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your knowledge, for your wisdom all through the session. Help us to have greater clarity and deeper understanding of these priceless teachings. Help us to absorb and assimilate this knowledge so we may become better instruments in your service. We humbly offer ourselves to do your work. With thanks and in full faith, so be it. Atma Namaste, everyone. Atma Namaste. Yeah, so we'll start off with uh, where we dropped off last time. Yeah, let me just mute everyone for now. So. Where we start? Um, the germs and impurities? Yeah, so uh, basically what we were looking no, at is we're going to look at uh, man, when man becomes ethically sensitive, in addition to sight, yes, uh, that is a clairvoyance vision that he or she has, other organs, yes, correspondingly also start getting affected. So it's not just their sight that starts to get affected. So this is something that happens. And so thus it is claimed by astrologers that if you look at the various um, planets that surround us, their influence does definitely affect us. And so they say that when the planets uh, 
their, their influence reaches us, there is either an expanding or, a con or congestion, which we call, which is also uh, excess energy, uh, in the etheric atmosphere has a corresponding effect on people who are meditating, either makes it better for them or worse for them. Yes. So there are these corresponding things. Now, for example, we know uh, the full moon, the moon, the moon is the one that uh, has a effect on the earth, on the globe. And therefore, the reason why we do twin hearts on those respective days. Yes. Now to move on, uh, when you look at it, they, they then talk about, now this is the influence of uh, external planets out there in our solar system. Then they talk about incense, right? Now they say just like colors affects the astral body, the incense affects the etheric body. And so you can use incense to try and bring about greater health. And so they move on to say in the last line that odors or different, different fragrances uh, may be used on various parts of even the brain. Yes, now... Um, to act do, on. Right. Yes, the, the fragrances act upon the brain to, to kind of make them uh, more efficient. And so there are people, for example, with aromatherapy, with incense, who say there is an effect on the physical brain. Now, you and I also know this, um, not so much with reference to all the, the varieties, but uh, when your home is cleansed, right, especially with uh, the religious um, prayers that we do, there's frankincense that's used, there's, like we mentioned earlier, samrani and the sandalwood incense that's used purely to cleanse and purify the space, the etheric space, right? And if you're there, it also ho hopefully also has its effect. Uh, depending on the beings that it's attractive to clean and purify yourself. And then they move on to saying that uh, the effect of the etheric site is quite different from that of astral site. Yes. Now, when we look at etheric site, if there is a, a box or there is a container like this, I can see through this, yes, through this metal into the, um, directly into the volume or the uh, whatever is inside the object, whether it's a flask, or a box, uh, whether it's a room, yes. So basically depending on the thickness of the, the metal or the brick wall, the, the clarity of what is inside is then visible to you and I. Yes, so that's basically what we talk about as etheric uh, vision or uh, etheric clairvoyance. Whereas astral clairvoyance is completely different. In astral clairvoyance, they're basically talking about you moving into what is called the fourth dimension. And so in the fourth dimension, the example given here is a box. Now the box is not a cube, right? It becomes almost flat where you can see everything. You can see all the six sides, you can see inside, and you can also see the particles, right? So that, I mean, it's difficult to explain because most people don't even know what the fourth dimension is. But for yeah, them definitely. who are able to explain, that's the easiest way to tell us. So I can't imagine what we would look like. We would look flat. They can see the front, the back, the sides, the, the inside, the outside, everything at the same time, right? So it's almost, uh, for me, it's not something I can imagine, but at least it gives you an idea of what this might be like, right? And so, um, and so they say that when you look at um, what W.T. Stead says, he says, when you look at etheric vision, he uses the word through it, yes? Uh, TH at the beginning, TH at the end. Yes, so that's through it. So he's saying it's like that when you when you have etheric uh, clairvoyance or vision, you can see right through, right, and into whatever is there, the space inside. And that's etheric vision. Now, the um, etheric vision has uh, also the ability for you to magnify, right? So if, say, for example, you're looking at a person and he or she is your patient and you want to further find out what's happening, say, uh, for example, the largest uh, organ that's there, which is your liver is affected. So you not only see the entire patient and his liver there on his right side, but you can zoom into maybe the, you know, the different sections of the liver and try and see which part is really uh, badly affected or if the, the organ actually is affected. So you can actually zoom in. And so they say that this, um, this is where it's important. I think Amit mentioned this in, in the last session. He says, for this method to work, yes, the impressions that we have with our etheric eyesight should be transferred to the etheric brain. But if there's no transfer between these two, which means uh, there is no communication line open, the person really cannot see. 
Yes, so though your eyes are perceiving it, but uh, the sight is not transferred to the brain. The brain doesn't have any information to process and can't give you. I'm talking about the ethnic brain. It's yeah, two parts. Things. The brain has to register it, then the brain has to process it. Yeah. So uh, the sight itself on the etheric level has to go to the etheric brain. And then from there, of course, going moving into the dense uh, body, which is the physical brain that we look at. Like sometimes you've transferred a file, like an image file to your computer, so you can transfer it, it registers, but you can't open the file because you, you don't have the software installed, right? It's not, it's not there, so something like that. So registering and processing. Okay. How you do it, they're not explained at all, but- Correct, but, been... but just to tell you that this is there. And so they say uh, the attention is focused in, so there are, um, the attention is focused in one or more etheric particles. And therefore you can either look at the whole organ or you can go to a minute part of that and then focus on it. Yes. Now uh, they say, oops, sorry, I moved out of my sheet. Here they go. Thanks, baby. All right, uh, so the commoner's method, um, this, that is the commoner's method, the method we were just talking about. How they say one that de demands more uh, higher clairvoyance or higher development of sight is um, a little interesting. I'm, I'm not sure how this really works. So they say it is to project a flexible tube, right? So, uh, so they're talking about a flexible tube, an etheric tube that is created in the center, right? So which we call the Agnya Chakra between your eyebrows. So that is then, uh, there's an etheric tube, yes, um, from the center of the chakram, having one atom at its end, yes? So they're talking about just one atom, and this atom has to be such that it's really fully developed with all the seven spirally. And this atom can be then expanded or contracted. So it becomes the lens, right? So based on that, based on this atom, it's like it magnifies. You know, um, have you ever tried this? If you've written something and if a droplet of water falls on that part, you know, that word becomes bigger. It's something like that, right? That's the closest I can come to explaining this. So it's like that atom is then used like the lens to then either, if you want to expand something and see, for example, uh, the physical heart or a lung, and or if there's something that's super vast, right and you want to see it then you want to see it in one vision then it can actually even make it much smaller so you can see the whole in one shot right so say for example uh, you want to see the the country of india it's too vast right now so you can actually bring the whole vision down to to say uh, the space that is just in the room so you can see the whole of india right now so they can do this it's, it's very interesting that the system uh, does exist and they can also do this um, distantly you know with something that is not they're not physically present in that place they can also uh, use it with reference to distant points so um, talking about the second method the first method being very easy the, the lens method <laughs> which we're talking about uh, this power belongs actually to the causal body so just want to emphasize that uh, so this power that we're talking about with reference to the lens is with reference to our causal body, which is the place and, and the level where our higher soul resides. So that when an etheric atom forms, the, uh, the lens, um, a system of reflecting counterparts must be introduced. So when you're using this, of course, you need to use the etheric as well for you to be able to see through, but it definitely requires, uh, the power basically comes from there. And you need to use your etheric matter to, or the etheric atom in this case, uh, to prove to be a good lens so you can actually see through. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's basically where I'll end, where I, where I mentioned that you can use the same thing to see things at a distance. Hmm? And also seeing things diminishing it. You can just finish the pharaoh thing. So, oh, the pharaoh. Okay, it's so it's this. To okay, fine. I'll just end with the pharaoh. So the pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, those of you who have done soul realization, this achieving. image is there. Yes, or, or achieving oneness with the highest soul. Uh, so if you've done that course, there is an image of this. Uh, the pharaoh, the headgear of the pharaoh. There's like a like a bird with uh, just the head and part of the neck, and then like a turkey. <laughs> yeah, and and then there is a snake. So they say that snake is supposed to symbolize this method, you know, where you have this, this, this uh, etheric tube to be able to clairvoyantly see. So one of the uh, so-called spiritualistic, um, um, what do you call it, um, symbols 
yes? For them is uh, the pharaoh where you have the snake coming out of the head. So that's where I'll end, I'll hand it over to you. And the turkey is the snack for the snake, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Friday night, so this is the most parting we're going to do. We're going to finish the chapter very soon, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And the book. It's not finishing this book. <laughs> Master Joe really said it's encyclopedic. It's really encyclopedic, huh? <laughs> yes, Priya, what to do? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. When a man becomes ethically sensitive. Um, <laughs> what, Sorry, what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, that means he can sense ethnic energies. Okay, so. okay, let me give you an example. Of Not that he's this. a crybaby. No, okay. no, yeah. Mine <laughs> so. might be a crybaby. So, you know, there was this lady uh, who's from Bangladesh City, who was an IT professional at that point. And uh, she did all the courses with Master Cho here. Uh, sorry, Master Cho's courses here. And then uh, she moved to the States for about two or three years. And I remember she's from the city of Bangalore. And when she came back, you know, she had this spray bottle. This wasn't very common in India in those days. I'm talking about early 2000s, yes. And when she would get into an auto rickshaw in Bangalore, she would spray the whole thing before she sat because she gets so contaminated. I'm like, what rubbish? Technically, I mean, you do get contaminated, you know. Okay, for like 18 it's, years, you've been staying here. Yeah, three years in the States. Can't change you that much. You, know, you get so, so contaminated. You're now aware of ethnic hygiene. <laughs> yes. So there are some people who are fanatical. I'm not, I'm just giving her as an example, but there are many. Yes, and they say, oh, you know, I can't go to that place because I'll get contaminated. I can't come to this group because I'll get contaminated. Some people uh, do get super, super sensitive. Yes. Now, for me, if Grandma Sachua, who's super sensitive, I know that. Yes. Could stay in a group with us. We are like 500, 700 of us. Barely stay. Yes. And he's, he does meditations with us. He comes close to us. I know he gets contaminated, but he handles it. Yes. Uh, and when people, you know, behave like this to me, it's like, hello, you need, you need to learn from the teacher. You can't keep saying I'm super sensitive. No, but he's the one who said that, you know, like, you know, the chair has been sat on, has been sat on by thousands of people. So. <laughs> yes, and he's given us techniques to deal with that. If you're really going to be I'm sensitive. just playing devil's advocate. But we used yes. to make fun of uh, a lot of them, you know. We would know, what was that? Which center was it in the States? Uh, anyway, we used to have a joke. We know that this person is a pranikila when they're walking along in the subway in New York and other places, and they're like this when they learn cutting cords. So they're walking every two minutes, they'll feel like this. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, my God. So no, I haven't met that one seat. yet. Very embarrassing. No, I haven't met those Americans. I have been there and met Arhatik Yogis and pranikilas, but luckily I didn't meet this one. <laughs> <laughs> kept cutting cords. There are a lot of anyway, so there are a time. lot in, uh, sorry for those of you who are not pranic healers, but it does happen. There was one time they refused to come into the hall, I remember. Oh, yeah, the New York one? <laughs> New York. Um, they were saying I it's contaminated it. inside the hall uh, and they are sensitive to the energy. So they're like, it's, the energy is not clean in the hall. So they want to, this is in Manhattan, right? In New York. So, um, New York City, sorry. And they're, they're refusing to come into the hall. And so people are saying, like, what, what, please come in the hall. Yeah, no, no, it's already in the hall. And Master Chua, the founder, is in the hall. <laughs> but they're not coming into the hall. And then Master Chua is looking at them. And then after some time, he says, we're in New York City. <laughs> Wherever you go, there's going to be stress energy. You're, you're in it. You're in the city. So there's nothing much you can do about it. True. Anyway. Okay. Now, incense is said to act... Who said? It's said, he said. It's said to act on the etheric body somewhat as color. Kind of, very vague. You know, very vague. They could have explained this. They just want to veil it for some reason. Anyway, somewhat. <laughs> you know, it's like how, I mean, like, you know, oh, it acts on the How? Somewhat. <laughs> Can you, if you give an answer like that, it's not really clear. Anyway. Uh, well, it's interesting because these people already know pranic psychotherapy. So to do pranic psychotherapy on Oh, they are Hatik Yogis. <laughs> <laughs> the clairvoyants. Uh, the, the ones who are in the future coming. Anyway. Um, the whole joke about all this is because I said ethically sensitive. Anyway. So, um, what? Oh, I skipped this whole uh, expanding <laughs> and congesting of the etheric atmosphere. Yes. Uh, very interesting uh, word. Make the condition of medicine respectively. You know Planets. what? You know what? 
the principle of astrology is there, but one of the principles of astrology is that the chakra, the planets are energy centers uh, of, the of the solar system. That's one of them. And depending on the activation and all that sudden movement of energy and all that stuff. But what is important is because, you know, uh, if you read the book, yeah, this is where I would give quotes from uh, the book, Existence of God is Self-Evident. It will talk to you and origins of modern pranic in Arhatic Yoga, it'll talk to you. And I think I've shown this before. Yes, I have in this, uh, that the movement of clockwise, when it moves one way, it draws in energy. When it goes another way, it draws out energy. So when meditators sometimes see flowers in the inner world, it's actually the planets and the movement of the, um, of the, I mean, if they see the solar system and flowers around, the movement of the pulling in of energy and giving out of energy, that movement causes an optical illusion of a flower, but it's not a flower. But what is what I'm trying to state is, energy is coming in and going out. So technically, if you have an etheric body, and your etheric body is part of the earth etheric body, I'm not going to go into the cell thing. We did that yesterday. I mean, last time. So you know what I'm talking about. So basically, every cell of your body is interpenetrated by earth energy or earth's aura right so when the energy goes in if say it's a chakra or say it's an energy center and it's moving inwards we don't know what energy is coming in we don't know from where it's coming in because the space is vacuum so is there air prana in space or what anyway what type of energy that is beyond the, the topic or right now but some energy is coming in which is vital for the existence of the solar system and the solar parabrahman and the and, planets, and the planets. This energy is coming in. So when this energy is coming in, I don't know about the time it takes because it's not my area of expertise, how much it takes to come in, how much it takes to go out, whether it happens monthly, yearly, weekly, God knows what. But the amount of time it comes in, when it comes in, my assumption is when it's completely in, that means all the prana is inside the chakra. It's just like imagine your chakra pulling in energy and you are inside that chakra. So during that time, energy is constantly being compressed. You understand what I'm saying? Is compression of etheric matter. And then after some time, there is expelling of etheric matter. No more shall be said on that. Yes. Yeah. So here we're talking about the planets. Uh, in last class, we spoke about how the sun has its influence on the sun. And today I also mentioned the moon having the influence on the earth. Yeah. All right. Uh, incense. Yeah, incense. Outside, they're talking outside. Oh, okay. Anyway, I thought I'm being uh, ethically sensitive. <laughs> anyway, we're going to come to that, the other faculty. It's, okay. it's good to laugh. It's the end of the day and it's good to it's laugh. Friday night, man. Hopefully absorb everything. It's so the best we get right now. Anyway, so incense is said to act on the etheric body somewhat as colors do on the, again, somewhat. Okay, we finished this, right? Yes, and I'm hoping rapidly. to finish this chapter. No, no, I'll finish it. I'll finish it. I'm going to go faster. It appears that certain <laughs> orders may act. Now, it appears that certain orders may act to, may be used to act on the various parts of the brain. For what do you want to do that? I don't know. I mean, you know, if they're going to use certain orders to have chemical reaction in the brain, they should have, maybe I should look at this book. I will go through it and see uh, whether it would be interesting to note for what, what is the, objective of creating the uh, you know chemical reaction but in general from our point of view this is one level of truth but also uh, and that's the principle between aromatherapy what sumi said and that's really really good uh, but of course it's due to the prana that's exuding from them and the prana has the effect on the body and of course on the brain because when you inhale it goes straight to the brain first Okay. You know, I'd like to add something here. I think there was a retreat. These add-ons are not part of my time that I'm using. Yes, yeah. she keeps this is adding my own on, time. So, uh, and then she blames <laughs> me for <laughs> All right. So I remember there was a time when we had a Maharashtra retreat. I think it was Mathira. And uh, Masachor actually got... 97. Mm, I don't think it was 97. But anyway, uh, no. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so um, there was this time that he gave all of us incense and actually got us to heal each other. Right. And so we had to use incense on our partners and work on cleansing and purifying ourselves. And that time it was only sandalwood. Right. That's the only time I remember him ever using it. And I remember for uh, a brief time, you'll find that all pranic healing centers, you know, where these are Hatik yogis had visited the, uh, had gone for the retreat. When they came back, they were all using incense to eat. <laughs> Today I don't see it. But yes, um, I remember that one time. 
etric cleansing was done by using sandalwood incense. Just yeah. wanted to share that. In the psychotherapy class, you used it to cut cords as well. To oh, cut yeah? cords. Okay. But, you know, you have to be careful when you're cutting the cord. Back solar, I know, if you're trying to cut the cord. Yeah, the city's still burning. <laughs> it's still fire. The smoke is... Anyway, because he said, you know, he didn't put all these things in the book because if he puts these type of things in the book, it seems to be unscientific. So he only put, you know, concrete things in the book. So there are things that can be written in books. There are things that cannot be written in books. Anyway, the effect of etheric side is quite different from the astral side. How different we... Let's see. In the case of astral sight, an entirely new element is introduced. Okay, so this is what Sumi said. I don't want to go into detail about that because time is With etheric sight, however, merely one sees through such consideration have no effect on astral vision. Okay, very good. Uh, <laughs> the word through it. Uh, in, okay. And the etheric sight can also be used for the purpose of magnification. The method is to transfer impressions from the etheric matter of the retina directly to the etheric brain. Mm. The attention is focused in one or more etheric particles and thus is obtained a similarity of size between the organ employed and some minute. Okay, they've said something very complicated for something very simple. We've explained all this. Sumi has also explained. So. I'm going to go into that. It'll take more time. Interesting information. Nothing really. Anyway, we'll try and sum it up. Uh, a commoner method is this like what is a commoner like for like peasants in those days they had peasants no right i thought the earlier commoner, one is a commoner like commoner method. it's like something the more like, use no no not that type of commoner you know uh the more common method i think so i would assume that because the next one they're talking about a highly developed version no. with the lens with the lens okay nothing great where's the lens it's all the same it's all this whole thing is the same method right okay no you're talking about this lens Anyway, first they say it's common, then they say demanding higher development. So if you're a commoner, how can you have a higher development? I don't understand. Anyway, is to project a flexible tube of etheric matter, PVC uh, tube. No, I'm joking. Yeah? Uh, from the center of the chakram between the eyebrows, having one atom at its end, which serves as the lens. This is the commoner method. Okay. Oh, it's a common method, yes. Yeah, okay. but more developed. <laughs> yes. A common higher developed method. Okay. A common uh, method amongst highly developed people. Yeah, okay. No, I you know why? Know. You know why? Because such an atom must have all seven spirali fully developed. Uh, I believe all seven spirali would be a holy master, <laughs> right? Because that is, we're on number three or four. So like, if you want all seven, you're definitely not a commoner. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, based on what we read. Okay, so fully developed. The atom can be expanded or contracted at will. This power belongs to the causal body. So it's from the soul energy. So that when an etheric atom forms, the lens or system... Okay, how much do I need to talk about this? A little bit or a lot? Whatever you want. Might be... Uh, when they say atom... You have to not take it literally, okay? There's not a dot there, all right? Uh, when they say atom, they're talking about something very, very subtle. Just like they say physical permanent atom, right? But that atom is still made of energy and that energy is a particle of energy, right? So when they're saying uh, atom, it's to describe the quality of energy. That's what I'm assuming here. Huh? Uh, it, it's to uh, determine the quality of energy of that part. And when they say this flexible tube going in and out and um, all these things, I believe they're talking about the, what we call in uh, pranic healing as the unicorn light. Right? And more than that, because that is linked to the causal body to a certain extent. And uh, more than that, we cannot talk about at the moment. And yes, about the spirale, uh, that makes sense. Anyway, by a further extension of the same power, the operator, by focusing his consciousness in there can project into distant points. So you can go into different realms also. Sometimes you feel like you've gone a thousand years ahead. So, I mean, I cannot explain more than that. Yeah, time is not... Uh... Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, for us right now, it's uh, almost seven o'clock, right? 7 p.m. in the evening. But uh, when you're looking clairvoyantly, it doesn't have to be 7 p.m. right now. 
it could have been 7 p.m. 10 years ago, right? They can, they can move through time. They don't have that limitation that you and I have. Master George, say there's a, in the inner world, there's a sense of timelessness, but here we have a schedule, so please come back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, by the further extension of the same power, the operator, blah, blah, blah. The same power by different arrangement can be used for diminishing purpose. Yeah. This is not explained too much. Uh, thus giving vision of something too large to be taken in at once by ordinary vision. Very interesting. And this power is symbolized by a small snake protruding from the center of the forehead in the head. So once they say uh, the center between the eyebrows, then they're saying the center of the forehead. And so that is why I believe it's the... When do you have that? Oh, yeah. Okay, Unicorn light. No, no, no. It, it is there. Sorry. It was me who missed it. So, yeah. And the spirale makes it more... What do you think? It's the uh, UL? Unicorn light? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so... Um, I, I think they, there's truth somewhere in between. Yeah, so we leave it at that. We cannot discuss it. Yeah. So, anyway, so much of the clear. Yeah, so the power. Yeah, done. Yay. All right, let's move on. So, the clear ones um, where people see dead people, right? Um, that's the, when we spoke about earlier, the uh, over the grave, the etheric body. So, Seance. Much of the clairvoyance shown by dead people at the spiritual seances, enabling them to then read through closed books. We spoke about this as a technique. Uh, I believe it's also being taught in different parts. Kids are also learning. It's basically etheric sight or etheric vision. Yeah. So that's that's basically it. So that uh, gives them sometimes the ability to also see. Uh, you know, if there is uh, one of those entity who hasn't decided to go towards the light and just hovering around. They might be also able to see that. But if they are little kids, sometimes that can get frightening for them. Yeah. Okay. Now, when we're talking about etheric uh, sight, yes, and uh, we're moving now to etheric um, telepathy. telepathy. And so there are two types. <laughs> yes. So one of the varieties of telepathy in etheric, <laughs> yes, uh, is where you basically have a etheric image, which might be seen then clairvoyantly, right? So. You, you just want to send this image to someone and it goes there and if the person is clairvoyant, they can see it. Now, the second one is basically where they're using etheric waves. And so the etheric waves, uh, which is generated by the person who wants to send it to the sender, is then radiated out by the sender towards uh, that of the receiver's brain. Now, depending on the sensitivity of that brain, then that person is able to then receive the currents, yes, these uh, etheric currents or the etheric uh, waves, as they say, and then use that wave as it comes to his brain to then uh, transfer it into the actual image. So from image to waves, received as waves by the receiver and then converted it back into uh, what we call image, right? Just like we do with uh, uh, technology today, but this is with reference to the etheric world, the etheric brain and the etheric image. The organ that is actually used for this whole process is interestingly what you and I call the pineal gland, which is at the pineal center. Pineal gland. In the center of the head, okay? That's UK probably, I don't know. Yes. And that is a US style of saying it. So anyway, so uh, the pineal or the pineal gland uh, is the instrument, right, through which this uh, information can then be received and sent out as etheric waves. That's according to me. I could be completely wrong. It says uh, the vibrations gland. are... No, no, I'm just saying that it's got to do with the etheric waves that we haven't mentioned. Uh, yeah. So uh, the vibrations are set up in the ether, right, uh, which, uh, which permeates the gland. So from there, the way I see it is basically like a radio wave, right? So from the pineal gland, the waves start to radiate outwards, like circular waves going out and then thereby causing a magnetic current. Uh, which gives rise to a slight quiver or creepy feeling, yeah, creeping feeling. So when you have that creeping feeling, basically in the case that the thought is clear, right, that you have a good uh, clear thought, it's strong enough and now capable of heading, um, heading to the receiver. It's, 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 its ability to transmit is, is complete. And then with most people, however, sadly, the pineal gland in those days are not fully developed. And so even if you've transmitted it, you've done a good job of, you know, uh, sending it Energetically, out. Energetically, yeah. Yeah, uh, etherically, you've been able to send out those currents 
those waves across. But if that person's pineal gland, the receiver is not upgraded, right? That, that instrument cannot receive the message. It's like you having a radio uh, system, but the radio system is so outdated that it cannot receive the waves from the radio station, right? And then to end with the last one, uh, there is known to occur students, right? The process through which um, using this, this the, the system that they have, the, the ray of light can actually be bent, right? So uh, a, a, a ray of light, which is usually Light straight, travels in a straight line. Yeah, li light travels in a straight line. They can actually bend it. And because they're able to bend it, people otherwise cannot see it. You know, it's like coded. And so the message that's being sent, if you are able to then bend it, uh, it's not received by others, but only those that you want uh, to be able to see to receive and then decode it, right? That's, that's what I understood. So it's- What are we talking about? Huh? What so these rays really when bent, invisible to ordinary sight. For what? I don't know, that's how they're coding it. I don't know, that's it's what I- It's a ray said. of light, it's not yeah. a message. Yeah, and so it is, okay. It may be summarized, I'll just end with this. That this phenomenon would result from a power to manipulate the particular form of etheric matter, which is the medium for the transmission of light. Now, I don't know why the light came in between, but... Do you think they're talking about light as knowledge or messages? Can't be physical light. I don't know. Why do you they, need etheric matter to They just say ray of light. So I'm presuming it is light. You know, light, love They're and just power. just talking about some method here. They just put this method here. I don't oh, even know what the relevance it? is. Yeah, because I don't have those relevant <laughs> books. So they're just talking I about how... Uh, occult students have this ability to bend light and when it's bent, people with visible um, eyesight can't see it. Only if you have uh, etheric eyesight or clairvoyant eyesight, uh, can you actually see this, yeah? And so this is a technique where you can manipulate transmission of a ray of light. Invisible helpers. Oh, I do have that book. All right, uh, I'm at your turn and I finish with a chapter. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I, you for uh, with us. I, I didn't understand anything of what they're trying to say. <laughs> So I'll just talk uh, about what, <laughs> what the, you see, what are they talking about? What are you doing? You're doing telepathy or what? You're sending messages to people? Yeah, the previous chap uh, previous two chapters, uh, sorry, previous two paragraphs are about that. Uh, because the various varieties of telepathy is etheric and may take either of two forms. Yeah. Etheric image, etheric waves. Yeah. Image. Read it out, striking up the etheric brain. And then vibration, etheric current, magnetic current. Okay, look, let's make it simple. Have you used a cell phone? Everyone has used a cell phone, right? So this is like a cell phone. Telepathy works like cell phones, all right? Um, what is the basis of the cell phone? Radio frequency or something like that, right? As, as far as I remember, engineering decades and decades ago, <laughs> right? Uh, it uses radio frequency. I think the range was 1900 to 2200 megahertz, something like that, right, at that time. Uh, mega is million and hertz is basically the unit to define frequency. So basically the cycles per second, okay? So if you look at it, it's about maybe at now about 2 billion cycles per second. Am I correct to presume that? 2200, yeah. So 2 billion cycles per second is how your cell phone is uh, transmitting. And that's super fast. If I do this, for example, just to give you an idea how fast that is, I'm moving my hand like this. This is about 20 to 30 hertz, like this fast. Ooh, 20 to 30 hertz. So it gives you an idea how fast 2 billion cycles is. It's fast, all right? Now, telepathy works in a similar way how cell phones work. It's based on the principle that your thoughts can travel, okay, um, in etheric waves. Okay, the principle is thoughts can travel in etheric waves. The physical planet Earth, like I said earlier, uh, has an energy body and you have an energy body and the Earth's energy body is interpenetrating your energy body, right? Okay, um, so when you think of something, it's made of etheric substance also. All right, and this etheric substance uh, is traveling in the etheric body of the earth. Now you want to say magnetic, you want to say waves, you want to say ethers, and you can use whatever jargon you want. But basically when you think of something, your etheric body vibrates and using the earth as a medium, 
where another person's etheric body is also attached, it uses that medium to go in waves towards that person. Do you get what I'm talking about? Even if you don't, I don't know about it. Um, <laughs> right? Now, the sensing organ is not the physical ear. The sensing organ is actually the etheric body because you're being sent etheric waves. So obviously, your ear is not etheric. So your whole etheric body would be the, would be the organ. Okay, you hear through, you hear physically through your ears, all right, but you feel, you feel all over your body, all right. Um, your sense of touch, you know, the sense of touch is all over your body, all right. So the etheric, uh, the etheric particles, when it comes to you, so that's how it sends. So when the receiver, it goes, um, the etheric particles in your etheric body, it gets registered to the etheric body, then it moves through certain chakras, which we don't have time to go into and it gets registered in the brain and then you sense what the person is talking about. That's why you see these movies, suddenly it's like, oh, and then you say, oh, someone's uh, thinking about you or something like that. You know, they, they mm -hmm. get jitters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, they say you sneeze. <laughs> I know, I know. So, you have hiccups. Yeah. Now connected with hearing is the throat chakra. I think they pass it through the throat and then get registered, right? So when you, so when the etheric or plasmic particles pass it through your throat chakra, it, it develops the ability to hear. Okay. It develops the ability to hear. Um, so when you hear, but, but when you do hear etherically speaking, like etherically the message, you sense it throughout your whole body. You can't, you can't really, um, it's not through the ear. It's not like how you would perceive it right now. I hope that's the best explanation we can give you right now. Remember we were talking about the blind people seeing with their fingers or even that's how blind people even feel when they're actually feeling, if you look clairvoyantly at them, what's happening is, um, the etheric particles, when they're touching the, the Braille, that's what I understood, I, mean, I might be mistaken. The etheric particles of the energy body passes through the Ajna and the forehead. Correspondingly, that's interestingly what they said. Okay, that's why I'm relating it. Okay, and it passes through the Ajna, when it passes through the Ajna and forehead, they can actually see with their whole body. All right, something like that. Okay, that's why in India, you have pictures of gods. There's a face facing forward, face facing right, face facing left, face facing back. Have you have you seen that? If you're from India, right? Dathatriya. Oh, that's Dathatriya. I thought that's three, not four. Dathatriya is triple aspect, right? Ah, correct. So you have these I think four. It's Lord Brahma. Whatever it is, um, you have each facing so that because when you when you perceive this way. You can actually see from the front, you can see from the side, right? You can see from the left, you can see from the back. You can even see up, you can even see down, all right? Depends on your intention, all right? So that's basically what they're talking about. It's for the future. That's what Master Cho was saying. Most people, they can see through the physical eyes and hear through the physical ears. But in the future, as the, um, but the oldest sense, according to Master Cho, was the sense of touch. Yeah. It's the most developed, right? Uh, that's why the sense of touch is distributed all, all over, over the body, not in a specific area. You right? can even feel with your nose. <clears throat> yeah. Right. You can feel not just with your fingers and toes. Everything. Yeah. You, someone touches your belly, you, you can feel it. Someone touches your calf muscle, you can feel it. So yeah. everywhere there is. So the same way, can you imagine you can hear through your calf, you can hear through your belly, you can hear through your nose. It's, it's and that's how, and, and, and so, so in the future, people will be able to sense, not just through the eyes, ears, through all parts. They'll be able to see from the front, up, down, left, right, even from their backside, <laughs> the butt, all right? Um, now, one thing is not mentioned here, but one of the very, very powerful etheric faculties and safe faculties this principle is based on is what we call scanning and pranic healing. So in scanning, we sense the energy, the etheric particles come in contact with our etheric body using a medium. That's how even distant scanning is done. And this translates into certain, from, the, uh, from the, one of the hand chakra, it goes through another chakra and we perceive it all over. We don't perceive it through the eyes. We don't perceive it through the ears. So if you've been scanning, when you scan, you, you can sense all through, right? All over your body, you can, you can feel. And sometimes even an image is created if you've been scanning for a long time. It's not really clairvoyance, it's also an extension of etheric faculty, just to give you an idea. Etheric sensitivity. Etheric sensitivity. Now, by the way, when they talk about uh, the man becomes etherically sensitive, it says uh, same time take place in other senses. I don't know if they're talking about clear audience, clear sentience, you can yeah. smell energy, hear energy, and all that. And that's the chapter is over, congratulations. You can start the next one. 
All right. Do you have something to celebrate? We're going to move to the next chapter. 23. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to chapter 23, uh, magnetization of objects. Uh, so for me, simply put, it's basically the radiation of energy coming from that object, right? So whether it's a phone, whether it's a book that you have, whatever it has, there is a certain amount of energy that radiates out of it. And so let's talk about this. Uh, so keeping that in mind, if you can continue to read. So it says here, uh, a man may employ his magnetism or vital fluid, not only to mesmerize um, and, and use for healing. Today that would mean something completely like not very nice. Uh, no, it's nice, but it depends <laughs> on who it is being uh, magnetized and vitalized. And mesmerized. And mesmerized. Okay, mesmerized. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so uh, they continue to say that... Um, this can also be oh my God. Well, yeah, with reference to... May also be used to impregnate physical objects. Yeah, Amit is reading, so that's good. It's somewhat yes. Is good. <laughs> yes, and so just like you can use... So impregnate it with the vital fluid. Yeah, so just like you can transfer energy to heal someone uh, through the, the concept of mesmerizing or other forms of healing, you can also transfer energy to an object, right? And, and that's why probably uh, in many of our systems, if we have um, teachers and gurus, um, you actually want to get something that they possessed, right? Like a book that they had or something that you have because you realize the object that they had with them is, is now charged, right? If I can use that word at this point, uh, with the energy of that amazing being, right? Uh, who existed or still exists. And so it says here that um, any object, in fact, which is, in, which is in close contact with this individual. And I'm assuming uh, the one I'm talking about is highly also spiritually evolved, will absorb that person's energy, the individual magnetism, as they put it, and consequently will tend to reproduce in that person. So when you, um, you know, say for example, this is the book of that great holy person and it comes to you. When you hold this book, the energy that surrounds this book and inside the book, when you start to read it, starts to affect you. Right now, because I'm talking about a, a spiritually evolved person, the energy component that is absorbed in this is very positive. And so when I start to read this book, uh, the energy is, this is a basic pranic healing book. So uh, it will automatically then give me that energy, right? And so it starts to uh, positively contaminate <laughs> my aura and my energy with the vibration of that person. This, of course, is part of uh, the rational of talismans, charms, and relics, as well as of the feeling of devotion and reverential, or which sometimes quite li literally exudes from the walls of cathedrals, churches, temples, mosques, yes, gurudwaras. Um, each stone, therefore, I would say it's really uh, magnetized with this energy, right? And so uh, the vertebrae, so, so basically, even if you take a chip, a small piece of uh, that holy place that you went to, right? Whatever that holy place is to you. Say, for example, uh, you're a Hindu and, and believe in Lord Vishnu, you go to Tirupati and maybe one small stone falls off from the temple. Take it and go because it's not just the energy of uh, the supreme being that is impregnated into that uh, that piece of uh, object, but also all the devotees have been coming because they've been constantly kind of the same energy has been released by them, right? And so for those of you who are Hatik yogis and gone to Master's Ashram, every time we go to the ashram, it's not just the energy that's charged by the teacher in that ashram, in the physical space of the ashram and the hall, but also every group that's been coming since 2003, into that place has started to further charge that space, right? And so uh, recently we had to renovate the, uh, the pyramid hall. And so whatever we got, you know, the debris that was taken from all around was then further put back into the earth in that because every part of that physical uh, concrete or brick or whatever was used has been charged with this energy and you don't want to lose that energy. Right. And so that was then put back in the earth uh, for the energies to continue to remain in the ashram. And, and this is what they usually do in most places. So when they break down uh, these amazingly uh, old churches, temples, I think people are not aware of this. 
And so if they have destroyed it, it's gone. And we're not going to get it back, right? Uh, it, it completely disappears when, when it's taken away or absorbed wherever it goes. And if it's not a clean place, then it doesn't. Right. Uh, so basically, uh, to continue. No, 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 because here, Amit, I'm, I'm still. Ah, yes, 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 yeah. Yes. So that's why, in, in this case, when they're talking about churches and cathedrals, these places, these um, home of worship, is usually consecrated by a bishop, right? And in many, um, for example, when you when you have even a new temple, you have a specific senior pujari or a priest who has to come to consecrate it you can't have a you know a simple uh, priest who can come to do that so whichever religion you are you realize there is a certain type of person only who can consecrate and here for example uh, one of the people who, who is quite high in the christian uh, system is what you call the bishop and so he will come to consecrate it and reinforce it uh, the reinforcing is by the devotional thought of all the congregation the people that come together into that church or temple or mosque or gurudwara to continue to pray to god right and so that continues generation after generation and in many places thousands and thousands of years and so the old churches old temples that still exist in different parts of the world are actually amazing points of this wonderful energy a good place to definitely go and charge yourself yeah so i'll end there i'll hand it over to him ah, i will read the first three lines <laughs> no, i'm just joking Okay, so whatever she said, this is fairly simple to understand. Those of you who have done psychic self-defense, you know this. Um, first, I'll just talk about it, then we can read it. Um, <clears throat> when you think of something, two things happen. At least two things happen, right? Uh, one thing is when you think of something, you generate what we call a thought form or a thought entity, right? We spoke about this. The second thing that happens is you radiate, right? You radiate, you, you produce signals. So many people don't realize that uh, human beings are actually sensitive electronic equipments. That's why when somebody's uh, not in a good mood, you go next to them and then suddenly you really know they're not in a good mood because they're radiating an, a, a field of, of um, you know, unpleasantness or they're emotionally not okay. Uh, and uh, sometimes they, it affects your radiatory field or your signal field, right? It's just like a, a TV station with a range, right? Now, certain people, they have a certain range and teachers, they have a big, big range, okay? Now, the concept of this is known as a psychic radiatory field in a book called um, Practical Psychic Self-Defense for Home and Office. Um, and this radiatory field contains the general what is it? The general what? The, what's the word? The quality? The quality. The content? The general, not content, the quality, right? So it contains the general quality of your overall feelings and emotions. So if you look at a person who's upset at that point, he would be uh, radiating a field of, you know, emotional whatever devotion, for example, what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, now if a person devoted. But in general, if the person is just neutral, his uh, the quality of his radiatory field would is basically directly proportional to the sum of the quality of the thought forms in the aura. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting into uh, uh, formulae, but uh, you remember the proportional to the sum of you see, you have a certain number of thought forms, you have some good thought forms, you have some bad thought forms, you have some angry thought forms, you have some depressive thought forms. Now, the sum of the quality of all those thought forms, the overall sum of the overall quality of all your thought forms determines the overall quality of your psychic radiatory field. Doesn't that make sense? Makes sense, right? You got me? Um, <clears throat> so why are we talking about this? I have no idea. Yes. So when people inhibit a certain space, like everyone is supposing stressed at work and all of them start to sit in a in, a, in, in that building and radiate stress, the building becomes having a radiatory field of stress and that goes in the walls, the floor, everywhere. So you come in, new employee on the job, you come and sit down, you're not stressed, but you're marinating in that field. So it affects you, okay? Now, uh, same thing if you're looking at in a prison. In a prison, what type of thoughts and emotions are people having, happy? Uh, laughable thoughts? No. Regret, fear, depression, all these types of things. So the quality of energy affects the earth's aura, not only the earth's aura there, 
it changes the quality of Earth's aura in that place and also changes the quality of uh, energy in the walls and everything. So even if you break that down, the earth aura is still there. <laughs> so you make a new object. So maybe the walls have been removed, but the earth's aura in that place is still contaminated from decades of uh, donations <laughs> or, you know, you know, it's been Contribution. uh, contributions. And uh, now on the positive side, like they're mentioning, if you're in a church, a temple, a mosque, or all these places where people are producing devotional energy, emotion of love, uh, happiness, all those kind of things, usually it's also devotion of, please give me, I want something, you know, usually that's why. That's why they have a lot of cleansing rituals, you know, in the temple with the bells and the frankincense and all these things to disintegrate that the fire and to keep all the good stuff. So they have cleansing rituals, you know. Um, uh, and so basically, um, that becomes very, very positive uh, in that sense. So imagine you uh, are vibrating at a certain frequency, right? You, you know, like I said, you are, you're made of energy. Energy vibrates. It's at a certain frequency. Your aura is vibrating at a certain frequency. And that place, because of people's high frequency thoughts, high state of thinking, higher mind, chanting, singing, praying, all these higher vibrations, the vibration of that place is obviously increased. True or not true? So when you, at a, you remember the tuning fork example in school, you tap a tuning fork, you go into another one and it starts vibrating similarly. So you are vibrating a certain frequency. You go into, you go into a place by, and you're feeling repressed. So you're vibrating at a lower frequency, but you go into a temple, which is vibrating at a very high frequency. What would happen to your overall vibration? Yeah, resonance. Sorry, Dr. Sagar, I don't know the words anymore. <laughs> so just remember the concept. So your whole uh, field starts to increase in vibration. All right. Now, when you go, uh, now, if you look at a teacher, the teacher, now, if you go on the higher level, you'll notice that that vibration on, a, on another level is based on, there was another thing I wanted to say. Anyway, forget about it. There were two aspects. One is the psychedelic one is something else. Anyway, so... Uh, now, when you look at the teacher, not only the teacher, do you think uh, saints, bishops, highly developed teachers are vibrating at a very low frequency or they're vibrating at a very high frequency? Very high frequency. That's why even when you sit in the aura of a teacher, you feel inner peace because, you know, it's vibrating out all the garbage in your system, <laughs> right? You, you, you feel good, right? So, um, so basically, this teacher, now on a higher level, the vibration of the teacher depends on the light, love, and power frequencies of each, the development of that. So based on the overall light, love, and power of the teacher, they will emit a certain psychic radiatory field. Because if you look at it, you're a being of light, love, and power, and I won't go into detail about this. What are your thoughts and emotions are directly linked to intelligence, directly linked to love or uh, emotion, and directly linked to, um, what is the word? Power, what is the Light, love, and power. No, intelligence, love, and will. So sometimes you have less will. So you're thinking, I'll give up and all that stuff. Sometimes you have more will. You say, I will strive forward. So all your thoughts and emotions that you have in your aura are actually light, love, and power. If you just, if you think of any emotion you've had, you can compartmentalize it in these three categories. True or not true? Think of any characteristic you have. You're happy, that's love. You're, you're, you're funny, that's love. You're determined, that's power and will okay so so it can be categorized in these three categories now with a teacher the light love and power what's the difference in the achieving oneness course we learned that that's the difference between your being of light love and power so are uh, the saints but what is the difference the quality and quantity of light love and power okay so you have a certain amount of love but mother Teresa has more love <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's the quantity and quality. Now, a teacher, presuming it's a developed teacher, has a highly uh, developed light, love, and power aspect. And um, so the vibrations are very, very high. So even if they take a shawl, they wear it. That's why I was wondering, why do people pay so much money for the shawl and everything? So um, they're wearing the shawl, they're praying with it, they're teaching with it and all of that stuff. That's why there's a tradition of uh, 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 church leaders. I, I don't know about the church, but certain spiritual leaders, when they leave and the next leader comes, they pass on that shawl. Have you heard about this? So they take all the, so all the, the vibrations are absorbed. So it's like a fixed deposit. You give them a boost. So they pick up where they left off, right? Now, supposing the teachers use it for some time, the vibration of that shawl, would be very, very high. Now, if you are vibrating a certain frequency, the shawl 
which has energy now, is vibrating at a certain frequency. If you put it on your body, which is interpenetrating your etheric body, what would happen to your overall vibration? It would increase, right? A lot. Now, suppose you don't wear it on your body, it would increase so much, you might pass out. So just don't put it on yourself, okay? Just a word of advice. Remember the song? We put it. Yeah, I remember uh, Master <laughs> gave us different I things. I thought I was strong. And I remember he gave us uh, a pair of socks with a lovely golden ribbon. And he says, you can put it on your head, right? When you meditate, but not every time, once in a while. <laughs> because otherwise the energy might be too much and you, you know you get over congested and can cause problems. I tried it. I don't know if I put it on the head. Did I put it on the he legs? He gave me his hat as well. So I have a... Anyway, I put, I put one of yeah. his socks somewhere. I don't know where. On the leg. I don't want to put it on my head. I put it on my head. I don't know. In just two minutes, I was just doing twin hearts. I was drooling. Like, ah, you know, like one of those people who've been drugged. Anyway. <laughs> so, because the vibration is too much, the chakras are being stretched. So, you know, it's too much. So, um, that was a long time back. Anyway, so, um, so what was I saying? I don't know. Yeah. So, now supposing instead of wearing it, you frame it, you put it in your house. What would happen to the overall vibrations in your home? Because that shawl now has an aura. So the overall vibrations in the house, would it increase or decrease? It would increase. And all the people living in that house, right? Are they absorbing prana from that house? Are they absorbing, assimilating prana as they, even the people who don't meditate, they're just sitting and breathing, they're absorbing, giving out. Would the quality of energy in the house, if it's vibrating much higher frequency, would it affect their daily life and the quality of their life? Definitely. So that's why people do that. That's why people do all these things. So that's what this first paragraph is basically can I say just to add on what Sumi was saying. So you can use it now. So why, what they call it talisman. So talisman we'll go into, I think later and um, individuals magnetism. So the energy now magnetism is basically based on uh, um, the spiritual energy uh, because spiritual energy, you are exhibiting so much light you know, there are certain exercises when a person has so much, you know, they're very dynamic, charismatic. Part of it comes from the basic chakra, the charisma connected to the earth core. And part of it comes, most of it comes from the, the soul. So the more soul energy radiating outward and the Kundalini is awakened, the more magnetic you become. Because of that, they call it sort of magnetism, but it has nothing to do with magnetism. You see, that's why the teachers are highly magnetic. You want to go to them. You want to do everything. You want to help them. You want to serve them. Everything. They don't even ask you. You still want to do. Right? So that is the whole idea. So when they touch this, even for two seconds, they touch this book. What is this book? When they touch this, the energy, because they're vibrating such a high frequency, obviously the vibration of this will increase. Or the signature. Because as you pass through certain uh, stages of yoga, there are certain yoga where your, uh, every cell of your body will be changed etherically to be able to handle more energy so because of that you vibrate at a higher and higher higher frequency remember the saliva experiment and all the experiment we can talk about it next time we already passed the time so that's the whole idea behind it now i used to think that you know uh, there are because the, the the author says uh, to use it to uh, impregnate physical objects in someone's any object in fact which has been closed so i thought not any object i thought maybe because there are certain bad conductors of energy there's leather there's silk so i was wondering whether those will also absorb but according to master Cho, i'll have to check my notes because this i'm not sure sure but i remember the essence of the teaching he was saying that initially even for the teachers the energy is so intense that initially it doesn't absorb but eventually even leather even silk everything absorbs the energy because it's so much is so powerful that's why the teacher's shoes although it's made of leather had a lot of energy so i saw his shoes once i wanted to wear it so i said what will happen they said you will disintegrate <laughs> i was very young strictly <laughs> so because you know he leaves his shoes out every time he watches tv or something in the house so i would want to try it on <laughs> so if you look at it uh, like what Amit did mention when you move into a space which is more serene like a like a holy space, you will sense it not in one area. You sense it all over because of the sense of touch that is all over. When you walk into a space where the energy feels good or not, it's all over, right? So you do become ethically sensitive uh, to places and people, right? And uh, when you want to meditate, the fabric Masucho mentioned is natural. So you could use cotton. cotton or wool, depending on the temperature in your area and not silk. Yeah, so don't use silk, even though it's natural, uh, based on what Amit mentioned. 
So with that, we'll end today, uh, else it might get a little too delayed. Enjoy images, your... Yeah. Images consecrated by Master, we will talk about later because those are different. It's not only his vibration. There are links to that. Yeah, it's uh, he and company. So let's uh, end with today's uh, session with a prayer of thanksgiving. Close your eyes, connect them to the palette. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chokok, Sri Lord Maha Guruji Neelam, to all the great ones, especially the great beings of knowledge, light, and wisdom, to all the great teachers and masters of theosophy, to the angels and beings of communication and our respective Wi Fi's, to our soul and divine self, we thank you all for your tremendous patience with us. Thank you for all the light, the knowledge, the wisdom, and clarity imparted to us. Help us and inspire us to continue to assimilate this and use it to become better instruments in your, in your work. With thanks and in full faith, so be it. Hope you enjoyed today's session. Atma yes. Namaste, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy. Uh, we'll see you on Monday. We'll continue with magnetism. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. Good night. Arigato.